My guests today are Adelaide-based acting agents, and in my biased opinion, two of the finest agents I know. They are the two leads behind AAA Talent, talent of which I am proud to be represented by. Having taken over the agency quite a few years ago, they've endeavoured to keep it a boutique agency, boutique in that they know everyone on their books so they can be fully immersive in their journey. They're both actors as well, with a love of theatre and screen, so they're well placed in knowing what is required of actors and how to support them. They've built up a wonderful relationship with industry representatives, casting agents, producers and filmmakers, not only in South Australia, but Australia-wide, which has seen AAA actors being placed in projects in all Australian state states, and now even overseas. Please welcome to the podcast, Nick Buckland and Karina Gunn. Hi, Ooh. thanks Hello. for having us. Good Hi. Morning, David. Thank you very much for um, uh, agreeing to come on board. And um, I'm sort of on a roll with um, differences in my podcast. Last month was my first uh, in-person interview. So I had Mr. Tim Hawkins sitting beside me. So I had some sort of um, technical fun trying to make sure that was working. And you guys are my first <laughs> um, more than one person guest. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, before diving a bit more, a bit more deeply into the world of acting agents, can you each give us a bit of um, background about yourselves? You know, where you grew up, uh, a little bit about your acting journey, how you both met, and um, how you both become uh, directors of AAA Talent. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I, I'm Adelaide born and bred and uh, brought up in Linden Park. Always wanted to act since I was four, putting on productions and acted all through. Um, went to classes when I was young, then became a teacher because I hated school, so I put it right and became a teacher so kids could love learning and love coming to school and feeling safe and loved. So um, that led me to teaching acting wherever I could because uh, that was my love. I ran my own business for 18 years teaching children with poor coordination and learning difficulties as well as those oh, wow. that came for the fun, teaching a specialised phys ed program and then got into the... Um, dramatic movement and drama and uh, then uh, study counselling at university which is also a wonderful aspect of understanding actors and people and characters and um, uh, psychology is a big part of it and then uh, met Nick on stage decided to get back to acting myself and not just teach it so Nick and I met when we were 45 and 50 as George and Mildred that's right my I blonde remember wig. that story yeah mm. And uh, after that, we started working together and, uh, and then ended up together in life. So uh, after about a year, I think it was, uh, was it about a year? Our agent mm. who ran Adelaide Artist Agency at the time um, was going into early retirement because she wanted to be able to travel and see her kids and offered us to purchase the business. And we sort of kicked each other under the table like this would be perfect because mm. uh, um, it was a bit of a dream of, of, of ours to just immerse ourselves. And here we are absolutely, what, 12 years later, 13 mm. years later, um, living the world of acting, working with wonderful actors um, and growing so much after working from home for years. We now work down at Jetty Road, Glenelg, and got a wonderful team of people with us. Yes, it's expanded a, a lot since I've been on board. So it's, and it's a great location down at Glenelg for sure. It's Nick, great. Yeah. Nick. Now, you've got an accent, so that's giving a little bit away. But Yeah, I've got a, a Brummie accent. I'm from Birmingham. Um, and as soon as I say I'm from Birmingham, the accent comes out a little bit stronger. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I only moved to Australia when I was 50, um, in the, the year that Karina and I actually met on stage. So I, I'd moved over to Australia. I'd been – my passion was acting as a, a teenager in that I'd was introduced to, to it by a, 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 a teacher at my school. His name was Winky Turner. He wasn't really, his name wasn't really Winky, but he had this little eye thing that he used to do when he was talking to us. So he really <laughs> called him Winky. So, um, so Winky actually invited me to, uh, to take part in a play when I was about 12, maybe 13. Um, and I was, I, I, it was an all boys school. So I played Angelique in, in a, in a Molly Air play. Um, and I found it strangely liberating, even though it wasn't my greatest wish to play a girl. Um, but I, I absolutely loved the whole experience, the whole stage experience, the whole, uh, the whole process of, of working together and working as a team um, and entertaining. And I just threw myself into it. 
I went to a very academic school, so most of the teachers didn't actually approve of it, but because they were too arty farty. Um, mm. But whatever, I still threw myself at it and had a great time. Um, intended to follow that as a career, but uh, it wasn't to be for uh, many reasons, um, mostly family related issues. So I ended up getting involved in work and mortgage and marriage and divorce and second mortgage and another one. And and so it went on until I reached the lovely age of 50 and thought, oh, hang on a second, I was going to be an actor, wasn't I? And I, um, uh, so I actually <laughs> came to Australia and uh, not because I wanted to be an actor, but I came to Australia for other reasons. I wanted to come here anyhow. I'd always had done for many, many years. Um, loved the approach of people here and the collaborative style of working with people, the openness. And I thought, if I'm going to move to Australia and, and soak up this experience, maybe that's an opportunity for me to look at going back to acting. And that's exactly what I did. I came here and I thought, right, let's give it a go and see if I can get work. I'd done loads of uh, theatre um, work back in the UK um, mm. over the years. Um but I was very interested to see if I could get involved in um, film and television. And, uh, uh, and that's what I did. And I found that having been involved in commerce for so many years, it put me in, in a good position. I had various sort of networking skills and techniques and uh, uh, ways of reaching out to people and exploring possibilities. And what I couldn't get over here, as I say, was this beautiful openness of people to, you know, when you reach out and say, hey, look, I'm interested in talking about something. Okay, mate, yeah, let's meet up and have a coffee. Really? Oh, that's <laughs> easy. You know, like, okay. Um, when can I pop in? Oh, whenever you fancy, mate, you're going to be around? Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, and, and it was really like that. And I found myself getting into talk to producers and directors and, and talking about projects and in no time at all i found myself being really busy with with you know um some of them were student projects uh, getting involved with unpaid film projects um but then getting some tv you know getting a tv commercial getting a paid film projects getting into another one and and it was all because i just threw myself out there and said hey look i'm I'm a 50-year-old Englishman, and I've got a lot of theatre experience, but I'd love to get involved in film and television. If you've got any roles, I'd love to have a go at it. Um, it. And people would say, yeah, come and have a go. Mm. Um, and that was really when Chris decided that she was, or, or, or felt that she was ready to, to leave the agency, and she spoke to Karina and I about it. It was basically on the back of the fact she knew that I'd built up this lovely raft of connections. And, and that's really... What I love, I love the fact that we have this lovely rapport with filmmakers and content producers that it comes from a shared enthusiasm to make entertainment. Um, it. And it's like for, for that door to open to purchase AAA, it's almost like it was just meant to happen after everything you'd done. It was. And it was known it as, did, yeah. it was known, known as um, Adelaide Artist Agency or AAA and and then we rebranded and thought, we need our own identity. So everybody was calling us AAA. So we thought, let's call it AAA, AAA Talent Agency. So the three mm. stars are actually um, three stars working together as a team, which the stars has right. been a logo in all our um, aspects of the business, which has evolved yet again. Mm. And I, uh, just before I go on to my next question, so that um, you've also branched out with the um, branding of um, Buckland and Gun. How is that working mm. with the AAA talent um, branding? I think if we think go back to our roots um, of the agency 12 years ago, as Karina says, it was Adelaide Artists Agency, AAA. Uh, and in those days, there wasn't a tremendous amount of of professional work happening in Adelaide. I don't think in the first 12 months, maybe even Two 24 years. months, mm. we had a single TV series made. And I can't even think film. of a feature film that was made in that, in those first two years. Yeah. We were doing bits of commercials and some corporate work and corporate training and so on, but not a film, not a TV series. And they just weren't happening um, because there wasn't, a vibrant industry here. Then when there was some investment, government investment in the SA Film Corp and the new studios, 
uh, and and you know to actually be able to boast boast that we've got one of the uh, one of the finest folio studios in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and this wonderful facility, and it started attracting business here. That changed the industry here, which is fantastic. It was a, it was a blessing, and we mm. didn't know that was going to happen, but it was wonderful for us, especially as we'd had a couple of years to get our, our routines together and uh, understand how we could run the business and how we could try and capture that sort of work. Anyhow, Adelaide Artists Agency was too parochial for us. Adelaide, we, we were already aspiring to get people cast in work interstate. And it was no good us being known as an Adelaide agency and having Adelaide actors only. So we needed to be a little bit broader based. So we lost the Adelaide. Artist was a little bit ambiguous. Um, what's an artist? Well, some people think it's a painter, not a painter and decorator. <laughs> but, you know, um, or it could be a mime artist or it could be a tattoo artist. Mm. It's just too ambiguous. So we, we wanted to get rid of the artist. So Adelaide Artist Agency became, as Karina says, AAA. That was that's been great for us, but there's still, without doubt, that connection and association with the agency that was made up principally of people who were aspiring actors, people who hadn't necessarily had training. Most of the people who had training were going into states because there wasn't an industry here. Yeah. So those professional actors, those actors with the uh, with the professional experience and professional qualification, had to go and seek work elsewhere. Well, when that started to change, we became increasingly aware that we weren't attracting those people to our book. And it's important that we have professional actors on our book because that's what makes the casting directors want to talk to us. And if we're talking to casting directors, then that's creating opportunities for everyone on the book Fair so enough. having an established stable of professional actors means that we get to talk to casting directors on a very regular basis that then takes us to buckland and gun management because we've now developed <coughs> established accrued whatever the the correct word for this is but we, we now have a very strong professional book of trained actors, experienced actors, actors with uh, credits to their name in, in ranking productions, um, and casting directors are talking to us every day, numerous times, about named actors, individual actors that they want, that they're asking to see. Mm. That means that our rapport is so much stronger. But what's also become apparent is that casting directors are a little bit confused about who are our professional actors and who aren't. Fair so enough. one aspect of, of what we're trying to do is to say, okay, here are our professional actors, Buckland and Gun Management. And casting directors will have no doubt that those people are absolutely ready practiced, experienced, know exactly what they're doing. They can walk into an audition. They can nail the audition. They can walk onto a set with top actors and deliver. And casting directors need to be assured of that. So knowing that means that we have the respect, if you like, of casting directors to be giving them appropriate and capable people. Mm. It also means, however that they're able to understand that sometimes we say, actually, we've got somebody who's developing at the moment we think you should see. How about this guy? How about this person? How about this mm -hmm. young lady? And, and we can actually be introducing other people to that book. And from that the, works from for us triple now. A pool, so to speak. You, Sorry? From, your tri from your triple A pool, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and, okay. and the AAA pool, we can now develop. We mm. can help them, and we can be getting them work in um, maybe the lower budget productions where there isn't that expectation that the casting directors and producers and directors will right. have, where they are saying, no, we're happy to look at new people. We're interested in seeing new people coming through, and that's great. When we know that's on the, that's on the cards, and there are some castings that come through, 
and and the casting director will say no this is okay we're okay to look at people who don't necessarily have experience with this one because we know that you know we might not find them for whatever reason so we're, we're prepared to look wider awesome. that's great mm -hmm. then we don't have a problem then we don't have to be as necessary as uh, i would say blinkered that's the wrong word but as focused in that sort of top tier of professional professional actors Fair and enough, then there's right? many castings that take place that need people that don't have to have so much experience so the more we can get uh triple a people who have got we have got experienced actors on there mm. um but they may work full time and not always be available whereas our buckland and gun people this is their profession this is what they do um mm. and we only have a small group we're closed and we're full on that we've got people in sydney and melbourne on buckland and gun management and AAA is just in Adelaide. And then we've got a new book again called BG Extras, where we've got lots and lots of background extras because, you know, Adelaide are getting a lot of films now and TV mm -hmm. series happening. And um, to help the casting directors out, we have accumulated a good number of people that we can put forward. And it became a little bit beyond the two of us. So now we've got a good team of people working with us. Because Slowly expanding, isn't it? Or quickly expanding, I should say. So. Uh, and I think yeah. that's a, probably a, a great thing to, to see because uh, if we look at the Eastern States and a lot of my podcasts, we always talk about the difference between um, us being out in the, you know, not the boondocks, but uh, not being Eastern States. So Western Australia and, and South Australia are quite similar. Um, we don't have access to those, those big name agents and they are the big name agents. So they don't have any, um, they don't have extra books and that. So you sort of miss that boat unless you've got that credit to get on board. So here we are in Adelaide now. Now we have an arm that actually is the best of both worlds, isn't it? We've got... Um, we get all the big, big top casting directors coming to us, uh, the big films. We've just had a wonderful success with our lovely Ste Stefan Tongan, who has just starts the film with um, um, Spiderhead. And his billboard is up in Times Square. Mm. And, uh, and we plucked him off the stage. So Love we it. were thrilled to get him that job. Um, somebody else has just been in a huge film in Melbourne. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got talent in Melbourne and Sydney and, as well, but actors in Adelaide don't have to live there. They can, you yeah. know, self-test can be filmed from here. We send them over. That's how these guys got these big films and there's plenty more happening as well. So I think the, it's a great example that, that Craig has given you and it's, <coughs> it's certainly not the only one. It's one of, of numerous that mm. we have at the moment. We can't talk about all of them because of some course. of the films haven't yet been, um, haven't been aired. So some of the, the projects are, are still in development. Some of the projects are, are still in, in post-production. Um, but, but what we have, have had a, a, a really good number of in the last six months particularly because – coming out of COVID, a lot of uh, uh, projects have gone into production. And we've got a good number now of people who have joined us, um, you know, a, a small number joined us as extras and decided to take it further forward and ended up being actors. And some of those have been actors. And Stephen Tonkin is a great example, and I hope he doesn't mind us mentioning him repeatedly. I'm sure he's loving every moment of it. <laughs> um, but he, uh, he, he, you know, he's somebody who joined us, as Karina said, from community theatre and, um, we saw him in a fringe show and, and absolutely loved what he did and we're talking to him. He was performing with other actors on our book um, and said, look, you should come along and we'd love to try and get you some work. Now, he's ended up, because there was a project here that was filming and there were support roles, but then there were one-liners, bit parts, mm. where they were open to suggestions from people who hadn't necessarily got lots of experience. And we were able to suggest loads of people. And we've had lots of people in, in films like Never Too Late, um, stuff like Escape from Pretoria, um, the, the uh, Stateless. Stateless, you know. Mm. Um, the, all of these projects, we've had people in The, the, um, uh, the Stranger, the, the Tourist. Um, Marvel films. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> thinking about the ones that have been filmed. Oh, in Adelaide, here, yes, yeah. Yeah. And, and these are things that have happened in the last couple of years or so. And we've had lots of people in one-liner roles, bit part roles, you know, coming on as a, a police officer and, and having a couple of lines. Um, uh, maybe not even having a line, but actually having a presence on screen with named actors. Um, and so we've got actors who've had two, three, four, five credits as, as a one-liner or in a bit part. 
they're, they're getting to the point where we can now start putting them forward for larger parts, for larger roles. And you get, and, and that's exactly what happened with Stephen Tonga. He, you know, he, he got four credits as um, bit parts in major projects. Each of those he'd had scenes with named actors. And we were able to put him forward when we saw a particular opportunity interstate mm. and we saw it we weren't allowed to talk about it it was highly confidential but we saw an opportunity and crystal who works with us uh, crystal cave lots of people will know crystal uh, crystal has sort of uh, picked it up and said hey what about this opportunity oh gosh you know there's right for that and we were all absolutely let's do, let's let's put him forward let's see if we can get him in there let's just see if we can and it's exciting because we you know we put him forward we pushed him we praised him we showed showed casting directors what he'd done they said, yeah, absolutely. Let's have a look at him. Let's get a, an audition. So we did a self-test. Uh, self-test was great. They loved what we did. Um, and it, it went on to a, uh, a callback and he was cast. And it was beautiful. It was great. Right. And, and that's what can happen. It, it has happened. He's not the only for. one. <laughs> of course. It's what so many – and like – and that's, I'm not saying that in a negative sense. No, it, of course not. Of course, it's what so I would. I'd love that to happen. I would love it. You know, I'm I'm happy doing anything I can because I just love being involved in the film process. So I don't mind. I, I, you know, I go on a set as an extra because I love being there and seeing what's happening. Mm. And um, but I'll also be out there networking and trying to pick up work for course, for other gigs with other actors. We stuff. never stop, even when we go out for dinner. <laughs> it's like it's forever yeah. talking to people. Yeah, I, that's I, right. I, just to, uh, quickly, can you explain, because um, my podcast does go to the States as well, so um, there's a big difference between agents in Australia and, and uh, the US, and, and I'm not 100% sure how they work in the UK, but um, what's your understanding of the difference between agents in Australia compared to the US versions? Because in the States, they have agents, both theatrical, commercial, they have a manager, they can have lawyers, and a, a whole gamut of reps. So essentially, you're just doing the whole lot. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I think that's, you know, look at population size. Look at the population of South Australia mm. and then look at the population. I mean, my, my identity would be um, go, go to England, go to London. Well, you know, the population of London is greater than the whole of Australia. Um, where I'm from over in Bristol, um, uh, say where I'm from, um, where I was living for the last 20 odd years was in Bristol in the southwest of England. You go over there and population of Bristol is greater than the population of, of South Australia. Wow. So, you know, so you, you have people who will work in a more channeled and focused direction. Because we have a smaller population, a smaller industry, less opportunities, we end up being broader based in what we do. We have to be. Mm -hmm. um, but that actually can work to our advantage because it means that we're able to to follow here in South Australia, particularly. We follow people through with a career. We can try and help people to go literally from, you know, school to, you know, working, you know, being involved in community theatre, and we can take somebody right all the way through the process to being in, in the uh, in a Hollywood movie. Mm. So Which we, we do, can, yeah, you know, so, and we love to follow our actors through. You know, sometimes I think people get a little bit impatient and think, oh, I should be put up for this. And it's like, you're not ready yet. We're very protective of our actors and making sure that they put their best foot forward. And if they're not, if we don't feel that they're ready to do that, it could be damaging to their career. So we want to help them get there to where they need to be because we know that, you know, some people will go to agents and, oh, I've been put forward. And it's like, but they're, we know the people they're competing against and um, that, you know, all the best to everybody you know we hope everybody gets there but we love to mm. watch the fact that people are on this journey and i say we want to walk this walk with you and help you get follow your dream mm. and and um we train our actors as well film their self-tests you know and that's been wonderful i think aspect of both being actors as well and we've gained so much knowledge working with actors mm. working in the profession working on films ourselves we're continuously growing so therefore we can pass on the right things to our actors as well and guide them appropriately, which is really important to us. There's a point you that Karina makes there about, you know, supporting actors and helping them and protecting them, helping but helping them to live their dream and yet at the same time uh, protecting them 
and not 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 exposing them, if you like, to to demands that would destroy them if they you know they get into a, a really demanding role and all of a sudden they, they feel out of their depth and it can be demotivating and demoralizing that's 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 absolutely right and it's it is a, a, something that we have to keep in mind there's another side to it and that's perhaps the side that i come from more because i'm looking more at the developing opportunities side green is looking more at the developing the actors side so i'm looking at relationships with the producers relationships with the casting directors and if if we're putting up people who aren't ready yet not only do we end up with a demoralized and demotivated actor but we ended up with a with a discredited reputation yeah. for putting poor people who can't do what we say they can do mm. um and there's another side to that as well with the professional book when we say that we're looking for people you know the professional actors are in the professional book to our mind a professional actor is somebody who's first job and first priority is is acting now not everybody wants to say that you know or can say that some would like to be able to say it but we're not in a position to which means that when we say okay look we've got this casting and you're gonna to have to go and do this i mean there's a there's a guy in adelaide who this weekend is is upping sticks and moving to melbourne for three months for a job he's had to give up his home wow because he can't continue renting it you know, and he's going to go to Melbourne for three months. And during those three months, we're going to try and get him more work while he's in Melbourne. So he can, he can carry on working there, or maybe he'll be able to go to Sydney afterwards. But like, that's, that's a level of commitment and dedication that we, we respect and admire. But it's also the level of commitment and dedication that's required Fair. by some hmm. production companies and theatre companies, because I, like, you know, old stefan he couldn't tell people why he disappeared off the map but for two and a half months he was gone nobody knew where he was and what he was doing now we can <laughs> and even when he came back he couldn't tell him what he'd done yeah um, and I, yeah and i guess that's fair yeah, enough uh, anusha zakesh once um told me that um because i flew to canberra for the audition and and mm. sort of not didn't get in trouble but she said you know no because for certain productions, they said, if you're not in location, there's production value. So you have to be able to be in a position where you could commit. So I understand that completely. If you're not a full-time actor, then you've got those restrictions. And, and you know, you look at my case, I work full-time. I work yeah. my acting around that. And we know that. And we, we work with it. Yes. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but that sort of leads to, um, I've spoken to a lot of casting directors and some uh, industry professionals, and they all mention um, AAA in regards to... Um, how you submit for casting jobs uh, that you actually do you look at the casting the, the brief and, and you choose the best actors as we've just discussed before whereas a lot of other agencies around the country um they'll look oh they want a 24 year old um, blonde female they'll put all 50 24 year old blonde females forward and so then the casting director's got to go through and, and call and find okay we're going to audition this 10 Whereas um, I think it's great that it's um, it's known in the, in the industry that you guys will go through, find all your 24 year old blonde uh, actresses or actors or whatever the brief is on your books and then say, who can do this role by looking at the character and looking at the storyline, knowing how that. Who do we believe is right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who we believe is right. It's the right and person for the job. Yes. There's, there's a really, I don't, you're probably not aware of this because it's been happening today. So there's a little example of something. Uh, that I'll share with you. Something we do that I don't want to tell you everything that we do that other agents don't do, or we don't believe other agents don't do, because I, I don't want to tell them how to do the job because they'll end up doing it like us, and then it'll make it harder for us to compete. <laughs> uh, we'll lose our edge. But but we we do go into state. We will go into state if we have an opportunity. Karina, myself, Crystal, um, we'll go to Sydney, we'll go to Melbourne, and we'll go and meet casting directors. And if there's an opportunity, producers. And and it was during in between COVID lockdowns, wasn't it? We were in Melbourne. We went to Melbourne and we spent a few days in Melbourne and Karina was working with uh, our actors and doing some coaching there. Um, Crystal was there recruiting new actors and looking at new people because she's responsible for the Melbourne book. And I was out going and meeting casting directors and talking to them. And the one particular casting director who a lot of people would like to get seen by, uh, but one particular casting director, we were sitting down, we were talking, I made an appointment to go and see him and we sat down and we were talking about people on our book and I was talking about people that I th really like him to see and he, he shared with me the fact that for every job unless it's 
got a, a degree of uniqueness, either by way of ethnicity or gender orientation or um, specific skills like uh, martial arts skills. And unless it's got those sort of um, unique qualities to the casting, he would normally expect to see anything up to 400 applications. Per role. Per role, yeah. Wow, wow. And, and like, so his process immediately is to, to filter out 95% of them so that he can focus on about 20 of them. Today, we had a really interesting casting from him, just by coincidence, because it, it just resonates with what you were saying. And we gave him, and it was a, it was a category where there would be lots of options, we gave him two people. They've both been called for audition. Beautiful. And I've got to do one of them immediately after this. And I know the guy's waiting for me. So, so <laughs> like, but like, that's, you know, that's, um, they take that's, you, you know, that, they... that's where we're focused. And we make sure that these guys, you know, the casting directors do respect our submissions. And we work at that. We work at it by going and talking to them and we work at it by the quality of the people we submit. And he made it clear that, you know, he knows there are some, um, agents interstate yep. he was referring to at the time <laughs> that would submit lots of people and mm. he says I actually don't look at their people mm. and so that's why we have to be so careful and we do pride ourselves on knowing our actors personally knowing their abilities we're very fortunate that we've got our studio set up that we work with our actors and um, film their self-test with them help direct them help make sure their auditions pop and they work Mm. Um, and we, we're known for our good self-tests. So we, mm. we go above and beyond. Most agents would say, send us a self-test, whereas we we work hard to make sure our actors are putting their best foot forward and it's it's paying off. And that's great. And, and that's good for the actors because, um, as we've already said, there's some agencies where they're submitting everyone and that's actually now given them a, a black flag against a whole agency. So that actually affects the career of all the actors, whereas doing it this way is a benefit for everyone on the books uh, going yeah, forward. I love it. Because mm. if there's somebody emerging and we say, "Look, we really think you should see this person," then that that that's okay. People will look at it. Look at that person. As far as casting directors are concerned, they're going to know us in the not too distant future, exclusively as Buckland and Gun. Um, which means that if we do submit people, even from the AAA book, we'll be submitting people as Buckland and Gun to casting directors. Okay. Um, okay. So that that gets us through the door without there being any ambiguity. And, and there's and no I, one called Buckland and Gun. Yeah, I reckon <laughs> if anybody tries to call us Buckland and Gun, we'll know that they're definitely trying to piggyback on the back of our name. Yeah. 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 So does that mean um, does that mean the actors that uh, can use the B&G um, name or they'll just stick with the AAA talent if they're on that book? AAA is still well known, so uh, but the Buckland and Gun management will start to emerge for those actors on that book. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's still I us. think I think <laughs> the deal right. is that our interstate work is going to be more Buckland and Gun management mm. uh, and our South Australian work with our emerging actors and our developing actors. Yeah. Um, hobby actors, our commercial actors. Hobby actors, actors commercial actors, mm. yeah. The, the, you know, people who aren't, that conversation that you had with Anusha Zarkesh, you know, about, you know, look, you, you can't just say, yes, I'll come to Melbourne for an audition mm. unless you're able to say, I'm here. Whenever you want me, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and that's got to be the level of commitment that you'd be able to make. Um so for that, those those are those are the people that we really are going to be able to promote and represent on an interstate basis. Mm. Those people that aren't able to do that, we can still put up for, for professional work. We can still put for professional work within the state, and we can still help people to grow into those roles. If Definitely. anything, we can do a better job for those people because this is where we're based. And if there's something you know. unique they're looking for, um, they'll pick anybody off our books to go and do a role whether they're you know whatever level they are yeah um, we had a fantastic example of that with one of our extras who got a role in um Chen Chi. Chen Chi. <laughs> yes i remember seeing that that's fantastic yeah mm. that was amazing and it was like he just had the right skills and the look and everything that and the right height that worked for him so there can be and that's why we have to have such a diverse book because we need a range of looks ages sizes eye color everything um, beards, no beards, you know, everything, because that's what um, helps get 
um, help the casting directors fill the roles for the producers and directors and also gets the work for our actors. Mm, awesome. Now to, um, to delve a little, uh, a little deeper and, and more towards the late bloomer aspect of the podcast and probably drawing on your experience as actors and, and Karina as a teacher, you have a broad range of actors on your books, as you've just said, uh, to meet the diverse needs of the, the casting industry. Do you see any huge differences in your actors when comparing young versus old? Are, are you seeing more formally trained young actors compared to their older counterparts? Because a lot of us older types like myself being 50 next year. Oh, my God, 50 next year. Um, I haven't had a that. Child. Young person. You child. I'm 60 next year, so you're a spring chicken. I'm not even <laughs> telling you. No, no. Uh, but yeah. 64. 64. I love it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, do, do, yeah, with your actors <laughs> on the books, do you see the differences between your trained actors and, and the actors who are untrained, whether the young untrained actors or older untrained actors, does the life experience make a difference? Oh, God, right. yes. And I think, you know, we've got professionally trained actors that are older that when you work with them, you're just blown away with what they give you. You know, it's such a delight. One lady comes in completely prepared with what she's wearing, her props, and she's done her homework and she's taught acting around the world, you know. Mm. Other people have worked on Coronation Street in, in London and, um, you know, it's like uh, oh, somewhere in England. Manchester. Wherever. Manchester, there you go. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> And, um, you know, when they come along, you see a big difference. Other people have just acted on stage for years and years and years. Other people sometimes blow away because they've just got the life experience. You know, young actors have to really use their imagination mm. uh, because they may not have love and loss. They may not have um, experienced certain things, you know, and acting, mm. of course, is going to have to use imagination because I've certainly never died and I've died in things. So, you know, I've never murdered anybody either, but, you know. I don't think I've murdered anybody in a film yet, but, you know. Um, so there's obviously an element of imagination. But as you get older, I think sometimes you bring life to your acting as well. Mm -hmm. And then it's putting together. But, you know, also a, a big difficulty is um, for a lot of it is the fact that uh, when you're older too, you have to be put forward with people who have acted, trained many years ago and have acted for many, many, many years. So, you know, we've got some famous actors that will always, you know, be put forward first and get roles and that sort of stuff because they're experienced. But then you can be lucky. Mm -hmm. It's all about the lucky look and the talent and um, there's not roles for everybody, unfortunately. We of wish course. there was. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. well, you, you know, you look at it and there are, there are two aspects to it. As far as and it is, it is exactly building on the points that Karina made, that when you're looking for capable young performers there are those performers who have natural ability absolutely natural ability they you know they were the kind of kids who get up and entertain the family and 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 do it really really beautifully well and have just that natural ability and confidence quite rare though and and even more rare is for those young people to have an understanding of life of a lifetime of experience you know they don't have it they haven't experienced some of the the pain some of the grief some of the conflicts that that we we build with our lives some of the tragedy that occurs loss i mean gosh you know you talk to actors and and you're thinking why aren't i getting anything here why isn't there anything coming i can see that you're you, you're you're trying to find it but there's something that isn't coming across and then you ask the question say have you ever experienced loss have you ever lost anybody in any shape or form no Okay, you haven't lost a relative that's died. A dog, no. something. Animal, no. no. Have you ever had a relationship that's broken up where you were fully committed? No. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. You're going to find this really hard because you don't understand exactly how that how gut-wrenching that can be and how just thinking back to it and, and contemplating it can bring, re, bring the emotions to the fore. So for some people, they actually do need that much more training to help them to understand and it, and to empathise with those emotions, but also to be able to access those emotions because they don't have a natural trigger. Yeah. They don't have those natural triggers within them. So, so training can be really critical. The older you get, the more experience you have, 
and the more experience of life you have, the more likely you are that you're going to be able to draw on that experience to understand character and understand story. Mm. But the other aspect of that, the, the bit that cuts across that, is that the older we get, the less likely we are to be in a position where we can take those chances with our careers yeah, and where we have the freedom to make those choices to mm. say, you know what, I think I'll go to Here Melbourne for three months. Ooh, who's going to pay the mortgage? Who's going to go to work? Who's going to do, you know, and you can't do that. You can't just up sticks and go. Yes. Um, and so it's, it's that uh, ability to be flexible that you have when you're younger, the, the, the opportunity to take the chances that, that you then have to try and match with skills and awareness and, and, um, emotional intelligence, the emotional awareness mm. of life. The older we get, the fewer of us there are because <laughs> we thin out. It's like my hair. Um, you know, the, the older it gets, the thinner it gets. And that's the same with the acting population. Um, and, and, and also uh, I think sometimes, um, I mean, we've got Nick's cousin who's 92, <laughs> 92. Wow. He came on as an extra in an advert years ago and he's getting some roles because, honestly, there's not many 92-year-olds left. So <laughs> He started a new career at 81, I think it was. It was. Oh, and it was like, mm. So, you know, sometimes there's a uniqueness with the age and, mm -hmm. and the life that comes to it. But acting's not for everyone. It's, it's a challenging... Um, emotional journey a lot of the time oh, and yeah. I think sometimes I think sometimes people you know I look at it and I thought after teaching for a long time what is it why don't some people get it and it's all about empathy and to me it, and some people have very a lot of difficulty empathizing with others and so you've got to really feel that if I can empathize with somebody I can step into those shoes because I get what might be going on for them and um, so it's not for everybody um, mm. But, it, you know, it's, it's a passion that people have and if they want to follow their dream, I always say aim for the stars. If you don't aim for the stars, you won't reach the moon. So Fair aim enough. for the stars and you might reach the moon. I love it. And so, so starting to wind up then, just focusing on that a bit more then. So for, for me, I'm, I'm the classic late bloomer and I just realised when we started the podcast, Nick, that technically you're a late bloomer too because you – didn't act all your age until you hit 50. Didn't act your age. Yeah. Do you like that? Um, we, no, he, acted, he acted a lot when he was young and throughout and got written up in magazines at home and things mm. like that. So he just had it with him. And do you know what I say? What? Every day we act. Mm. Our greatest acting takes place every day. How many times do people go to work and they feel like rubbish and they have to go in and, hello, everybody. Certainly my greatest acting with my father, watching him go, it was like I walk in and I'm a mess and I walk in, hello, my lovely daddy, and I put a bit of a, sp right. step in, a skip in the step and then I walk out and I crumble. You know, we don't always show what's going on. It is a, it's something that we do naturally every day. Mm. Learning the skills for film, television, theatre, musical theatre, all those things, there's certain things we have to learn. But there is a lot that's intrinsic that's within a lot of people. We just have to guide them how to draw that out. I love it. One of the things I say is that to be a good actor, you need to have both talent and skill. And, and talent is something that you can't give somebody. You can't... You can't create talent it's something that's in you and and it, whether it's a talent to be Unleashing. an empath whether it's a talent to be a storyteller but the skill is the techniques that you learn so you can learn the skills to actually make the most of the of the talent that you're given mm. I you know, and that and that and that's when i look at it i think well okay does this person actually have the talent or and, and is it just about helping them with their skills or is it a case of saying it doesn't matter how many skills we give this person the talent is never going to come through and you've got to look at that and work out where the balance sits um and what the capacity is and you know it. what acting really is it's play acting i always say we're unleashing the child within because children play naturally and as adults, I say, I say to the kids when I teach them in my Kismet Drama pro program, it's like, um, you know, especially the young ones, did you ever play dress-ups and make-believe? Oh, 
no, no. I said, <laughs> we do. But we call it acting because it sounds so much cooler. That's so we're better. all pick kids playing dress-ups and make-believe. <laughs> I love it. So, Living in an imaginary world. <laughs> so that sort of um, summarises everything then for, for all actors and late bloomers that um, you've just got to keep pushing and keep striving and, and you have to understand where you are and where you want to be and where you can be. If you look at my journey, I, I'm still reaching, still struggling and pushing to get that paid professional role, but we've already discussed tonight what's holding back's not the right word, but why it's not coming as quick as, as it is. But this journey is a long journey, and I'm in the fortunate spot that in nine years' time, I'm going to be one of your retired actors on your book, and I'll be able to go wherever you want to send me. So, I'm And you'll be able to that. look in nine years' time. I think sometimes people think it's going to happen, happen immediately. And our professional actors, you know, you think of how many have made it in the world in, in acting. Um, our professional actors who are trained, who are experienced, um, still wait for roles at times and yeah, then, then there's lulls you know mm-hmm. and we always say we can't create the jobs I mean we've tapped in on many of them that go around Australia we're so flat out and we've got Lauren who's just joined us as an agent she was trained in um, uh, in musical theatre in London she's a Scottish lady very experienced worked at the West End worked on the cruise ships and came over here saying I want to be an agent and she brought something unique, you know, some professionalism that we thought she'd be great. She works with Crystal in the office with us. We've got Kate, who's an actor in um, Melbourne. We've got Samantha, who's also an actor, who's doing all our accounting stuff at the moment. We've got a great team of people to big work family. with us. Who, family. It's one big family. Picking up on something you said there, David, you were saying about, you know, it, things aren't, are coming as quickly perhaps as you'd want them to and you know and then yeah. awake waiting for this to happen this break whatever it might be um and uh, there's something about it's great to aim for the stars but if all you're focusing on is the destination mm. you won't enjoy the journey you yeah. have to enjoy the journey and mm. being involved is is the greatest gift of all the fact that we're actually doing this stuff, Definitely. the fact that I can be on a set as an extra, I can be there just watching it, watching people doing wonderful stuff, I, or I can I can enjoy the the pleasure of seeing an edit done to some work that that and some actors have done. And you think, oh, that's great! I love what's happened. I get a kick out of watching people do auditions, mm-hmm. and it's, you have to enjoy the journey. Otherwise, the destination isn't worth going to. And and a lot of people do struggle. You know, psychologically, this industry, you have to have your feet firmly on the ground. You have to sort of, I say to people, why do you act? And if somebody says to me, oh, for the notoriety, I think, don't do acting. Mm. Wrong reason. Act because it's It's in the blood. Act because it's Mm. fun. Act because you love it. And don't wait for the paycheck. Go out and do community theatre. Make your own film. Do what you do. You know, it's like um, keep doing workshops. Keep. Love it. I mean, people go oh, and pay to go to golf because they love it. Mm. Pay to go and do courses, yeah. keep the training. Mm. Actors never stop studying. I, I played golf for a while. I was absolutely rubbish, but I did enjoy <laughs> being out there on the course. Yeah, it was okay. I, I never expected to win an open, you know. And, it's, mm. <laughs> and you're certainly and then, right. And I mean, when you, sorry, go on. I was going to say, and then when you're enjoying that journey, like Nick was saying, and then something comes out, it's like bonus but also i think a lot of people think that you know i I always look i always say to actors who's in need here because we get a lot of actors that say i haven't had anything i'm desperate i do know how much i've put into this and how many courses i've done and and i said yep uh, it's our dream it's our drive it's what we want to do go and do it you know don't just sit back and wait Mm. people have to work at their as as they're a sole trader as an actor they have to put in work as an actor as a business we work along with them but also the fact that, um, oh, what was I going to say? I've lost my train of thought. Um, uh, yeah, that journey of getting there is is the most important thing. Definitely. And then yeah. if something happens, I, I can't remember what I was going to say. That's cool. That no, that's cool. And that's, and that's yeah. why I do, I, you know, I do my podcast, um, which is part of acting, and, and, and it gets me to meet yeah. people and talk about it. Networking. My, my Facebook yep. group, like sharing. You're part of it, mate. That's yeah. what I was going to say. You're I was, part of the I was going to say, yeah, and yeah. I was going to say acting is one of the most giving things. You know, you see 
uh, professional actors and the people who are loved out in the industry. Stefan Tongan is one. He oozes love. Mm. He just oozes it. We've got other people that come in and they're just so happy to see. They acknowledge everybody. They just ooze love and they're giving people. So it's all about going on set and what we're doing is giving a choice to the casting director who then gives a choice to the producer. They're the ones in need. They're the ones that spend millions of dollars on films. So I always say to the actors to psychologically cope with this crazy industry in, remember you are the giver. You're giving them a choice and you may just have the right colour eyes for that choice. Love it. But quite That's often it's not about your talent or anything it's about the fact that you're the right got the right color eyes beautiful it's crazy and that's a perfect way to end our discussion i think so uh thank you nick and karina i'm mindful of the time of course so before i do let you, you go i have to throw the fast round at you a lot of podcasts do it and i've decided to keep it in uh you need to try and answer the questions straight up no thinking um nick you can go first followed by karina and then i'll do the next question there's only four uh what's your t-shirt quote Never too late. Love it. Karina. Oh, I've got a new one. Shit happens and then you use it in your acting. Love it. Can I get that? <laughs> you do. Okay, I love it. Better than shit happens then you die. Or, I'll, or <laughs> pink clouds of love to everybody. That would be my other one. That's yours. Send you say that all the time. And as you're both, you're both actors, uh, what famous role would you like to do if you could go back in time? Nick. Oh, God. I, I I I always go back. I, I love I love Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. I always do. I just I I'd, I'd love to go for something like that. I oh, I I I want to do it different. I'd want to play it different. I, I I wouldn't be um yeah. I wouldn't imagine that it would be worth even trying to play it the same. It would, I'm not that presumptuous, but uh, I'd love to to have a go at that sort of character. Oh, I'd like really to see lovely you character. Too. I've seen you play some bad yeah. guys, and it, it's an interesting watch. Yeah, such I like that, guy. guys. Mm. <laughs> Karina, what role would you like to do? Oh, people, I ask people this, and I, I can never answer it because there are so many. Um, I mean, I'm a real musical theatre fan, so I think I'd have to be Christine in Phantom of the Opera, but, you know, you'd have to sing and dance, but that's... <laughs> sold, sold. Okay. Yeah. And the last lead question, uh, who's your favourite actor on the books? No, I'm only joking. I know it's, <laughs> I know it's me. Hello, David. <laughs> We love right. you, David. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This has been fantastic. I really, uh, truly appreciate you coming on the podcast. And, Nick, I just wanted to say quickly, going back about enjoying the journey and that, my favourite part of my journey so far was being on set with you for Antares, of which the oh, you can see the are in the background there. So yeah, good on you. Um, <laughs> I absolutely love that, and I miss that, and I really hope that we get an opportunity to um, be on set again, which I'm sure we will. Um, we will. Your insights into the world of, a, of an agent is what we were here to discuss. Uh, it will it will resonate for all my fellow late bloomer actors, but I, I reckon also for actors around the world. I'm sure. Uh, so for the benefit of my listeners, before we That's shut down, right. where can actors find you? Because obviously you'll take actors on from all around Australia and the world now. Um, yeah. where, where can they look you up? Uh, look, if they search Buckram and Gun, or if they search AAA Talent Agency on the web, they'll find us. And we've got a brand new website just about to be launched on the 1st of July. Awesome. And on Facebook, uh, Facebook as well, you've got a page Facebook, there. So. Facebook, 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 yeah. anywhere you want to go, yeah. Yeah, we're at the Thank end of so my much speaking for having role. Us. Thank you very much for being on board. I love it. Thank you uh, for having us. It's a real honour. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Thank David. You. Good Thank man. you. Keep up the good work. You too. Love you guys. Bye-bye. See you, bud. See ya. Well, that was certainly a great discussion. Although Adelaide-based, this talk about acting and my relationship with my agents it's certainly an eye-opener for all actors. It shows that the, the actor-agent relationship is all about collaboration. You work with your agents as much as they work for you. I hope you got something out of that, and regardless of who represents you, you take away something positive from this. I'd like to thank all my regular listeners. I now have a dedicated email address, so if you'd like to drop me a message, just for your support, or if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, let me know at the late bloomer actor at gmail.com. Don't forget to throw a rating for the podcast on your podcast player of choice. Leave a review if you can or register with www.podchaser.com 
and rate and review the podcast there. And if you can, share the post uh, podcast on your social media. Let your friends know that you're listening and hopefully they'll jump on board. And once again, thank you for listening and I'll see you on set. You have been listening to the Late Bloomer Actor Podcast. Please like and subscribe on your podcast platform and share amongst your friends and social media. The podcast has been recorded by Riverside FM. Check the show notes for a link. A big shout out to stagemilk.com for keeping me fresh on my acting journey. And finally, the music within the intro and outro is written and composed by Aidan Hendry. See you all on set.